Hi, everyone. We're about to get started. If I could ask you to please find your seat. Um, if you do have a CEU form that you need stamped, you can leave it at the table over there in the back right of the room, um, and I'll give it a stamp and you can pick it up at the end of this session. All right, I'll just give people a quick second to find their seats, and then I will introduce our speaker. All right, so this is session 1C planning, uh, and our presentation is called Getting to the Point of Nutrient Limits, an Interactive Tool. Um, and our speaker, Katerina Meselgidis, she's a water and wastewater process engineer with five years of experience in planning, piloting, design, and plant operation. Katerina is an avid user of BioWin and GPSX process modeling software to support clients in evaluating treatment performance and process capacity, as well as evaluating process optimization scenarios. Katerina used her process modeling software experience and process knowledge to aid in the development of the POINT tool. Please join me in welcoming Katerina. Can't remember the last time somebody pronounced my name properly. <laughs> It was really good. Um, well, welcome. Thank you all for joining me in this very large room. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the point tool, um, which is an interactive tool to help uh, utilities quickly evaluate and understand what um, what their options are for nutrient removal. So I didn't do this tool by myself. Um, I had an awesome team working with me to help develop it. And part of those, some of those people are Art, Heather, uh, Mayron and Sanaz. Um, the tool was developed uh, with a collaboration between our internal Stantec folks, as well as with the Stantec Institute for Water Technology and Policy. If you're unfamiliar with what the Stantec Institute is, um, we are a branch of Stantec to aid um, and enhance our client experience with, um, with different various research projects. Um, and Many times these projects are funded internally, so it's something that we really care about and something that we're willing to put our own money towards because we really believe in it. Um, and that this tool is one of those one of those projects. So to spoil my whole presentation, I'm going to give you my key takeaways just so you can keep them in the back of your mind. Um, first one is the point tool is used to rapidly compare different treatment technologies um, to funnel the available options and save. Uh, evaluation, save on evaluation costs. The second objective is to simplify the complex concepts of nutrient removal in an easy to use tool. And the last one is to understand and illustrate the gap between the existing treatment capabilities and potential future limits. So today I'm gonna go over some nutrient loading challenges, the development of the tool and do some demonstrations of how it works. So, Taking a step back on, on why this tool is so important, across the globe today, we have 400, over 400 water bodies that are at risk of severe environmental degradation from nutrient pollution. And what this graphic shows is a world map of where there are eutrophic or hypoxic environments along or within water bodies. And there are some other locations where improved hypoxic conditions are being are being seen, but as you can tell in this figure, there's a bunch of places that there are eutrophic and hypoxic conditions. So what is meant by nutrient pollution? Nutrient pollution is caused by non-point sources such as runoff due to fertilizers or point, dis point sources such as wastewater treatment discharges. Uh, eutrophication is the process um, when a, uh, a water body becomes excessively um, enriched with minerals and, and nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. And that can lead to hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen. So the typical cycle of eutrophication, and, and this, is, this happens over time. It's not, it's not something like a flash flood event or, or a wildfire event that can happen instantaneously. It takes a long time to see the impacts and, and um, see the impacts of nutrient pollution. So the first step in eutrophication is when Nutrient loads um, are entering the water bodies uh, due to those non-point and point sources. That causes plants to flourish, algal blooms, 
and decomposition of those um, organic matter can, can lead to uh, depletion of oxygen in the water bodies. And ultimately that leads to depletion of ecosystems. So two examples um, that, that illustrate this, this challenge are um, the Long Island Sound, which is all the way on the, on the East Coast, um, and the Puget Sound, which is close to home here. In Long Island Sound, this figures um, back from 20, uh, 2012, um, where they were seeing dissolved oxygen concentrations down to the zero to two milligram per liter range, pretty severely towards, towards, that, um, towards the left side of the screen. And over in the Puget Sound, we're also seeing these challenges where there's a concentration of nutrients that are getting trapped in, uh, in the Puget Sound and aren't able to be um, flushed out. Um, so that's causing a lot of these eutrophic conditions. So in order to address these challenges, water quality limits on effluent nitrogen and phosphorus are becoming more common. Um, and particularly in this area, it's more tailored around the nitrogen limitations. So how do we do that? As engineers, we know, you know, there's non-point sources, the point sources, um, we're all, you know, experts in, in the point sources. So um, looking at the nitrogen removal processes, there's about 20 to 30 different processes that can be applied to address nitrogen um, in wastewater. And some of those are on the screen. Um, this is just a five minute uh, word cloud of all the things that I can come up with. So I'm sure there's a lot more um, but this can be a lot to handle for utilities where they don't necessarily have the expertise in understanding what is different between an MLE process versus a BART info. Would we need a five-stage BART info or a four-stage BART info? Um, how does an integrated fixed foam activated sludge process work? And how does that differ from MLE processes? So, um, and all of these have specific key process considerations when we're looking at process selection. That can be influent flow, loading, process temperature, COD to N ratio, um, F to M ratio, food to microbe or ratio, reactor volume, hydraulic retention time, solid retention time, and the list goes on and on and on. I mean, I'm reading these, but, but there's a lot of factors that play into the impacts, the, the, the level of treatment that you can really achieve and that also relates to capital costs and o &M costs. So um, thinking about all of these and thinking about how facilities are particularly around here, they're not really necessarily designed for nutrient removal. Um, in the Puget Sound, most of the facilities are designed for BOD and TSS removal, not nitrogen removal. So how do you take all of those process considerations? How do you take all of those process, uh, available process technologies and be able to narrow that down to a handful of treatment processes to be able to evaluate those at a uh, reasonable cost. The other component to this is that many operators and regulators are unfamiliar with nutrient removal technology and, um, and they have to make these decisions really fast. They have to make these decisions within a couple of years to be able to meet their compliance schedules and construct a facility and modify their facilities to be able to achieve these low nutrient requirements. And the last item on here that really facilities um, are faced with, is faced with is that it's really expensive. Coming from a modeling standpoint, modeling, uh, the first step in modeling is to do a sampling, uh, sampling plan to understand the influent wastewater characterization. Then you look at historical data and you build the model, you calibrate the model, you validate the model, and then you can all just see these dollar signs stacking on top of each other because it's very expensive to go through all of these evaluations. So how can we do that quickly and effectively? And this is the introduction of the process optimization identification for nutrient treatment. It's a mouthful. Uh, so the point tool, the, point tool um, the goal of it is to have a a powerful visual visualization tool, which is built by process modeling and, and built by um, the typical conditions that we, that we see at wastewater facilities. So the point tool can also illustrate that gap uh, between existing treatment capabilities and future potential limits. And 
provide a clear indication of performance of different treatment processes. So when I was referring to the MLE process, what is the maximum capacity of an MLE process to treat the influent wastewater? How much percent nitrogen reduction can you achieve through that process compared to a four stage barred info process? And the last item here is to be able to provide our clients with a very simple visualization and graphical representation of what it takes to get down to those limits. And this can be used in, and help the utilities with, with communicating that to the regulators for them to understand, you know, for me to get from 20 milligrams per liter down to five milligrams per liter, that's a, that's a lot of cost, capital and O&M to do that. So the bottom line, the point, the benefit of the point tool is to be able to provide a rapid, a rapid assessment of different treatment technologies um, and shortlist viable options and all do all of this at a very low cost. So as we develop this point tool, like I mentioned, we, we base it off of process modeling and there are various process modeling approaches um, that we typically use models for. So it's really important to understand what the limitations of this tool are, because this isn't a one-stop shop for the, the solution to all of your problems. It's just a tool to, to, to start the conversation of what nutrient removal would be, um, would be, what would be needed to achieve nutrient removal. So the, the four different approaches of modeling are an alternatives review, which is a very high level evaluation of understanding what the, the possibilities are out there. And this is typically done using historical plant data or typical wastewater conditions. A design tool, um, using modeling for design tool is usually done by, by looking at the, the historical plant data and calibrating and validating that model. So this is more, more involved, specific, very specific to the plant um, compared to the alternatives review that doesn't necessarily have to be specific to a plant, but it could be specific to a specific wastewater strength. Um, and then the, the third one is process optimization. Again, this one is a little bit more involved where we're looking at a calibrated and validated model using that historical data to understand um, changes for existing infrastructure and how can you optimize your existing plant to meet new, uh, new changes or optimize that process. And then the last one, is it can be used as a training tool. And again, this is more of a typical, um, using typical wastewater conditions. So for the point tool, we're really focused on these outer edge uh, uh, purposes where we're looking at it for specifically for an alternatives review. We're targeting typical wastewater conditions. And we can also use it for a, as a training tool to, to better illustrate the impacts of different process conditions. So when developing the tool, we use GPSX to, to conduct all of these simulations. We did a, a sensitivity analysis on carbon to nitrogen ratios and SRTs to, uh, to estimate process effluent, uh, total inorganic nitrogen or TIN. We evaluated four different process configurations in the current tool and we'll continue to, to add more processes as, as time goes on. Um, and all of the simulations were conducted at one MGD to provide a unit flow through the process. Each, each process was evaluated at low, medium, and high wastewater strengths. And the purpose for doing this was to allow us to, um, to talk to multiple clients, not just one specific client. So this tool wasn't built around just one wastewater strength. It was built so we can change the different influent conditions and understand how how those also impact the effluent concentrations. We also looked at two different wastewater temperatures, 11 degrees and 20 degrees. Um, this, this typically, um, um, the 11 degrees uh, wastewater temperature are typical winter temperatures compared to the 20 degrees, uh, which is more typical of summer conditions. Next, we, we looked at carbon to nitrogen ratios ranging from six to 15 by adjusting that, those endpoint conditions and carbon, uh, carbon addition. And then lastly, we looked at SRTs ranging from five to 15 days. Overall, each of these process technologies that we evaluated 
required 66 simulations. So we had completed about 264 simulations to build this tool. So when we're talking about those key process considerations, we, I mentioned that we wanted to build the simple tool that, um, that, that uh, still represented these process conditions and, and process limitations. So going back to these, all of these are color coded for different conditions that relate to each other. So for example, SRT, mixed liquor, wasting flow reactor volume are all connected. If you change one of those, another impact, another one of those is impacted. Um, SRT is also impacted by influent loading, F to M and COD to N, but um, I had grouped those a little bit differently just because they're more around the, the influent conditions. And then looking at influent flow, hydraulic retention time and recycle rates, those are also all connected with hydraulics. Um, so overall, we wanted to simplify this model and provide uh, provide simple input so we can uh, we can better tailor these conditions to the facilities that we're talking with. Um, and that's why we selected to use variables of SRT, COD to N, and temperature, because those are very common, readily available data that um, that can be used. So looking at each of the processes that we looked at, so I mentioned we we simulated four different processes. The first one was the modified Lutzak Ettinger or MLE process. This process has an, an anoxic zone before an aerobic zone. We used 40% volume for the anoxic zone and 60% volume for the aerobic zone. We have an ML, IMLR, intermediate mix like a recycle, and a secondary clarifier, uh, sorry, a, uh, a RAS from the secondary clarifier back to the anoxic zone. For the IFAS process, we Add, we use the same configuration as the MLE process, but we added 30% media fill to that aerobic, that aerobic zone. Um, and the, the purpose for an IFAS process would be to increase your aerobic capacity um, by adding a biofilm process. And in all of these scenarios, we use the same volumes for the low, medium, and high wastewater strengths. So it was a constant across the board. The next two processes were a four-stage Barden foe and step feed. The four-stage Barden foe was uh, is similar to the MLE process. However, it has um, a, a secondary anoxic and a secondary aerobic zone. The secondary anoxic zone has a carbon addition with supplemental carbon. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides and why that, that one is particularly important. And then the last process is a step feed process where we were splitting the flow between three uh, anoxic zones, a 70%, 20%, and 10% flow split. So we looked at a low, medium, and high wastewater strength. These are all book values, um, particularly for BOD, TSS, uh, total nitrogen, and phosphorus, um, with the exception of COD. COD, we did look at the book values, however, in order to be able to provide that sensitivity of the COD to N ratio, we applied a range of that COD to vary that COD to N ratio. So for each of the processes, this approach was slightly different. Um, like I mentioned for the four stage BART info, we had a carbon dose at the second uh, secondary anoxic zone. So the way we approached this to keep all conditions the same and to keep it apples to apples, we we ended up using the lower range input for the COD as the influent condition and varied the, the carbon addition via the supplemental carbon to provide the same, uh, the same COD to N ratio for all four processes. So with all of that said, uh, with 264 simulations later, we worked with our data scientists and developed the point tool. And this is what the point tool, tool looks like, where, uh, is there a, a laser pointer? If not, it's okay. No, it's okay. So for number one, you can see we can enter in the, the process type. Um, in this case, we entered in a step feed process. Number two, you get, you go and, you, you go and select uh, your wastewater strength. Next, you select your wastewater temperature. 
And then once you select all those three components, it, it shows up one of these graphs below, um, which is specific to that treatment process and that temperature and that wastewater strength. What we also added in a feature of is adding in your plant's operation. And what this means is um, what, whichever facility we're working with, we could enter in the COD to N ratio, the SRT and the, F, the current effluent TIN concentration. And then the plane that you see in the left uh, hand graph, the blue plane is the potential permit limit requirement. So, what all of this means is that the black dot, which is the current plant's uh, performance, it would take the amount of change between that point and the plane in order to get to the effluent requirements required by the permitting agency. So that's a lot of information, and I want to take it step by step and show you how this, this tool really works. So we're going to look at three different, um, three different concepts. The first one is the impacts of temperature. The next one is the impacts of wastewater strength. And the third one is the impact of process configuration. And if you know me, I love baking, so I couldn't help myself but compare this to baking because it's very similar. Uh, the impacts of temperature can impact the kinetics or the yeast that we use to grow bread. The impacts of wastewater strength very, are very similar to the available energy that you need to, to make bread, such as the type of flour. Your bread flour versus all-purpose flour has a different protein content, which means you would have a different amount of reaction occurring. And also similar to that is water content as well for bread. Um, and then the third one, the impacts of process configuration relate, relate over to the mixing method that you typically would use for bread making. And the moisture content. Are you slapping and folding as you're as you're um, as you're going along the fermentation pro process, or are you steaming your bread as you're baking it? So all of these impact the end result, and that's what we're trying to illustrate: is that bread is a silly analogy, but it's the same thing with wastewater treatment. So first, we'll look at the impacts of temperature. So I have a little movie here to demonstrate how the tool works. So first we select the process. We have a drop-down menu of all four technologies. Then we select the wastewater strength. In this case, we're selecting medium wastewater strength and 11 degrees Celsius. And now we're entering in the plant conditions to illustrate that point of where the facility currently is. And now we can also compare it to a second process. Um, again, in this condition, we're just looking at temperature, so we wanna keep the two different processes the same. So within this tool, we can pan the, the graph in any which direction. So if the point is below the graph, then um, well, that would be a good thing for your facility, but it's, it's also that you could see the full 360 of the, of the graph. So um, these are a little hard to see. So what I ended up doing was pulling some screenshots from the tool um, just to, talk a little bit about what these mean. So we have a color scale from zero to greater than 20, and this illustrates the total inorganic nitrogen concentration, which is also similar to the y-axis. The x-axis is the solids retention time, SRT in days, and then the, the z-axis is the COD to N ratio. So, the graph on the left represents 11 degrees Celsius, whereas the graph on the right shows 20 degrees Celsius. What this comparison is showing is that the temperature impacts the sensitivities to SRT and COD to N, where the graph on the left, your SRT is, your, your process performance is really sensitive to the SRT. The more you go, uh, the more you increase the SRT, the better the process performance is. And this is all related back to kinetics. If, you're, if your bugs are really cold, they're not gonna really wanna work and, and, um, and perform really well. If they're really warm, like the graph on the right, um, it removes that sensitivity of SRT and the main sensitivity is towards COD to N. So that's how much food is available. Um, so going back to the bread analogy, if you start trying to ferment your bread and your dough in really cold temperature, it's gonna take forever to, 
to actually produce a, a good loaf of bread. Um, and similar to wastewater treatment, if your wastewater is really cold, it'll take a really long time for you to get the same amount of performance um, as a warmer wastewater. And one more thing on this previous one is that this black dot shows that if the facility was operating at a 10-day SRT and the facility was converted into a step feed process, this would be a viable technology to evaluate further. Um, but let's say your treatment process was at a five-day SRT and that shifts it over into the, into the orange and the yellow. This process would need to, your SRT for your facility would need to be increased, which results in a higher cost, a higher capital cost, higher O&M cost, in order for you to get that same performance. So the next, the next concept to, to look into is the impacts of wastewater strength. Again, we have a movie showing the, um, the tool where we select a Bardenfo four-stage process with low wastewater strength at 11 degrees Celsius. And we'll put in the same conditions, 10 day C 10 day SRT, 10 COD to N ratio, effluent TIN concentration of 20, and a typical permit requirement of eight milligrams per liter this time. And now we'll compare it to a medium wastewater strength. Same temperature. Again, this, this, this scenario is comparing the wastewater strength, the wastewater strength. So we would like to keep that temperature the same. And what this is showing is that. With a lower wastewater strength, there's less um, there's there's less nitrogen to um, to remove from the process. So when you're when we're looking at that those lower SRTs, there's less of an impact um, just because they're the process is doing a little bit. Um, whereas over to the right, we have a really high uh, wastewater coming in, and it can impact. Um, impact the performance down at the lower SRTs. But as we, as we shift over to the right and have a higher SRT, there's a lot better performance. And I wanted to also highlight, this is for an MLE process. I removed that black dot just to, just to show a little bit more extreme what these conditions could look like. Um, so for the MLE process at a low wastewater strength compared to a high wastewater strength, again, same temperature, we're, not even able to meet the permit discharge limit for the MLE process at that high wastewater concentration. It's just because there's too much food available where the, where the process can't perform down to that permit requirement. Some, something <laughs> uh, nerdy that I saw, if you remove all, <laughs> all restraints in the process, um, looking at the growth rate, just the growth rate of of the process, and you turn the the step feed curve um, to match match the x and y axes of growth rate. It matches the exact same uh, the exact same performance curve. Um, something that I just like saw, and I was like, "Wow, that's really cool." <laughs> um, all right, so enough of that. The last uh, the last consideration and scenario we looked at was the impacts of process configuration. Um, and I'm going to skip over the movie, um, but I'm gonna just going to jump right into comparing a MLE process to a four-stage Bard Info process, both at medium wastewater strengths, both at 11 degrees C. So now we're just looking at process limitations. So over on the left, you can see that the MLE process can't even go get down to the required permit requirements, which means that this process would not be viable for this facility at these wastewater conditions at this temperature. No matter how long of an SRT you have, no matter how much carbon you have coming in, it, the process is limited by its, its ability to reduce nitrogen down. But on the right-hand side for the four-stage BART info, we see that plane going down um, a slightly below the three milligram per liter range. So this process could be viable if that nutrient limit was, was really low at the three, three milligrams per liter. So another example is comparing the MLE process to an IFAS process. And the main thing I wanted to highlight on these graphs is that 
when you look at an MLA compared to IFAS, it removes that SRT sensitivity um, because there's that bio growth that's on the bio, uh, on the media that's uh, suspended in the mixed liquor. So you're, you're adding a little bit more resiliency to the process where it's less sensitive at those low temperatures compared to the MLE process without, uh, without the biofilm. Now, that's a lot of information and you might be asking, well, what does this all mean? What, how can this really be applied? Um, the main point of this is that when you look at comparing different types of processes, you're looking at basically a cost. In order for you to move your, your facilities point from 20 milligrams per liter all the way down to 10 or 20 milligrams per liter down to three, that, that corresponds to a capital cost, an O&M cost that could be really large. Um, and even when you're looking at comparing different SRTs, if you wanted to, to increase your SRT to meet specific nutrient limits or increase your COD to N, um, N uh, ratio to meet those nutrient limits, that relates directly to a cost. So this can, can help utilities uh, have those conversations with the regulators to say, you know, we can do all these things, but it's just a matter of how much, you know, how much cost it will, it will impact. And again, we return to the key takeaway slide. Um, we, the goal is to rapidly compare treatment technologies in a simple way and illustrate the gap um, between where the facility is now and where it needs to get to. And if you're interested in talking to us about the point tool, here's all of our information, um, some additional resources, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Katerina. I love the bread analogies <laughs> that you included. Um, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, there's a microphone here in the center that folks are welcome to, to walk up and use. I can also bring the microphone around. <laughs> uh, define free. <laughs> um, so the tool is available via the Stantec VPN. So you would need to have a Stantec representative with you in order to operate the tool. Um, so, but we're happy to have those conversations to, to walk through the tool with, with utilities and yourself at, um, at any point. Fun? Could, I, could I ask you to go up to the mic just so our live stream people can hear? Thank you very much. Okay, is that better? Uh, I was just curious how many uh, cities and municipalities in the Puget Sound region have you worked with uh, with this tool? Uh, it's a fairly new tool, so we haven't rolled it out completely. This is the first time we're actually presenting on it. Um, so we are happy to talk to anybody about the tool and help improve the tool to make it more applicable to facilities. Um, good question. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. It's really neat. I have a question for you. Do you have any next steps for implementing the tool or is it pretty much ready to, to use as you intend to now? Um, it is ready to use as we intend now, but there is always room for improvement. Um, we'd like to build it out to include uh, some more additional processes. Um, and this is only specific to nitrogen. It doesn't include any phosphorus component onto it. So there's opportunities to uh, evaluate phosphorus removal as well as nitrogen. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? No? All right, please join me in thanking Katerina. <laughs>